it wasn't my fault, it's the litany's fault. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Okay, well, let's begin with prayer as is our custom. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of the Holy Scriptures. We pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, they will be transformed from signs on a page and the channels of grace into our hearts. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Psalm 137, it is like the probably most scandalous, most difficult psalm to grapple with for modern Christians. Not just modern Christians either. It, it, it's been a problem for quite some time. Um, and so it's, uh, so basically I'll read it in full and we'll go back and... By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs and our tormentors asked us for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites the day of Jerusalem's fall, how they said, tear it down, tear it down, down to its foundations. O daughter Babylon, you devastator, blessed shall they be who pay you back for what you have done to us. Blessed shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. There you are. There you are. Yeah. This doesn't make it on the Sundays. <laughs> this isn't something we sing on a Sunday. But it's really so, so to kind of come at it you know, to take a step back, to, to kind of evaluate its its season layman, its setting in life, it is it's not actually a psalm like the ones we've been doing. If you kind of read it carefully, it's not in a sense addressed to God until the imprecation at the end. It's there's no like, oh Lord, you know, this has happened. Usually psalms will start out with a vocative or some sort of invitation to praise or oh Lord, you know, we've been suffering. Um, it's it's actually comes to us that this is in some you know for those of you know like the song of Solomon is is essentially you know kind of old, a secular love song that then was brought into the canon has this reflection of God's love affair with Israel right and then again gets allegorized by the Christian tradition of the patristic period to God's love for the human soul and that you know etc etc in a similar way. This comes into to the tradition of the Psalter, essentially has a folk song. This is what scholars think that this is actually, this is not a Psalter that was like, again, it's, you have to remember, it, this is after the temple's been destroyed. That's the setting. So it clearly dates itself. I mean, again, this for the David wrote all the Psalms. This is what I'm saying. It's like, you know, the Jerusalem's been destroyed. We know that that happened after David, right? Okay. So... Clearly, this is not a psalm of David or of Solomon or of Asaph. This is something that's coming in the exilic period, right? And one which is, I think, you know, again, so it comes to us as a folk song, which then gets brought into the, into the Psalter, into the sacred tradition. So let's, you know, why? You know, like, how could? But it ultimately, it is a... We are called to receive it as a song of resistance. That's what this is. It's really a folk song of resistance on the part of the oppressed. Part of our discomfort is we've been on, the shoe's been on our foot. For so long has a great power in the world that it's hard for us to kind of read this stuff. But this is a straight up lament on the part of an oppressed people. Could you imagine the people of Ukraine saying this song, and appropriately so. This is a song for people who are getting crushed by the boot of an oppressor. That's this song. And the fact is that mainline liberal Protestantism in, you know, with like capital L, like as a tradition from the 19th century, but mainline liberal Protestantism is completely divorced from the Sitzenleben of oppressed peoples. You know, it's just, it's, there's no contact. 
between the mainline traditions, you know, be it Episcopal, Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, whatever, and the setting of this psalm. So again, so that's why the mainlines have no idea what to do with it. And they're like, they, you know, we, don't, we don't plan it in the lectionary, we don't even want to talk about it. They will, I've heard a priest um, in another diocese a long, you know, far, long time ago, but he talked about the psalms, some psalm, some psalms, by which he meant this one and others, had sub-Christian. I'm like, huh, that's I'm like, well, I could dig into that. But anyway, but because, you know, it's embarrassing. Well, I'm so sorry the oppressed embarrass you. I'm so sorry the powerless are a scandal to you. And that the, the cries of those who are suffering, those who cry, the, I mean, this is a psalm of victims. And so, in a sense, that's what we need to come into, first of all, is to hear this with the humility of understanding that this is the cry of the victim against the victimizer. So, that in and of itself. In that context, in that context of victimization, of, again, from the perspective of the exile, total loss of political, economic, and social independence being brought into, you know, being brought into a foreign land. In some ways, it's remarkable for how restrained it is. So we'll take it kind of from the top and work our way down to the difficult bit at the end. I mean, that, that way, it's like, again, we have a problem of like dashing infant's heads against the stone. Um, but it's, again, it's a song of resistance. A song of resistance. You know, kind of, you can get a touch on this kind of a little bit of like bluegrass from like, from the Kentucky mines or, you know, from West Virginia mines, like folk songs from West Virginia. You can get in the company store and you can, in a sense, get a, just a, the barest sense of what songs of resistance are in our culture. Right. By the rivers of Babylon, the first, in the verses one through three, the, the, the thematic opposition or the is there versus where we want to be. Right? The word there is repeated. And I tried to emphasize that as I read it. There we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. Zion is where we want to be. That's where our true home is. But we are there, meaning Babylon. Babylon is not a here. That's kind of what the psalm remember, that Babylon is not a here. It's a there. And we are trapped in the there instead of being home here. That's the, the depth of the, the kind of the thematic opening of the psalm. Is it contrast the there of where we are when it's not here, where we want to be? A strange land, a foreign land. On the willows there, and Augustine makes the point that willows are a tree that does not give fruit, despite the fruitless trees. And so then, of course, you can reach the end of the Psalms and in all this about how the trees that are planted by, you know, the streams of the wicked, they don't bear fruit. And so we're, we're caught in a land that is sterile, is fruitless. A land of, of the, the, the simulacra of life, like a willow tree is still a tree, but it doesn't give you anything to eat. So what good is a tree like that? Right? You know, it's like, we want to be in our vineyards, where we have palm trees with the oil, and, the, and we had vineyards with grapes, and we had the date trees, and we had, you know, those, that's, those are real, those are real trees, those are real plants. They give fruit. But we're stuck in the land of willow trees that give human beings nothing edible. Right? We're in a fruitless land, a sterile land. And on our, the willows there, we hung our harps. In a sense, the gift of song, that basically the Psalter itself, the gift of song has the gift of praise and of true speech. In a sense, in that land of sterility and oppression and injustice, the land in which we're stuck has God's people. In that land, in a sense, our the true gift of speech dies. We, in a sense, we we can't speak truly in a in a barren land. How can we do that? We hung our hearts like can't do it. For there, in the 
give us. For there, our captors asked us for songs. And you can imagine this as something that would happen, right? As a way of humiliating your captives. Sing us one of those folk songs from that, what, where are you from again? Oh, yeah, Judah. Sing us one of the folk songs of Judah, would you? Yes, I like, you know, these slaves are so, they're so exotic, you know, they, I love their music. Right? So the invitation to perform for the oppressor has the depth of humiliation. Like, sing us one of those psalms. It's like, that, this is, you know, we can't, like, there's a disconnect because, you know, and the, and the cognitive dissonance of the captive who is being forced to sing the songs of joy and the, and the songs of their homeland when you're there. And it's, it's, it's not just running salt in the wound, it is like the, 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 the de-selfing of the captive. Because if I can force you to perform that song, I, I've taken that from you. You don't own that anymore. Now I own that. I own you. I own the deepest and most valuable part of you. I've taken it. That's the depth of the oppression and the pain, the sheer pain, that this psalm is registering. Sing us one of the songs of Zion, and then again you have the there versus the here. Zion it represents, again, the here-ness. Not that every Jew lived in Jerusalem, but that was their home. Their spiritual home was Zion, the city of Jerusalem. And in a sense, there is a place, can only be a place of weeping when it is not the here of God's presence. And that's, it's, it's a song of, of profound Alienation and separation from the things of God's presence. How can God be present in that one? And that is, you know, it is one reason the prophetic corpus. You know, you almost have to read like Ezekiel alongside of this. Read Jeremiah and say, basically, God's with you out there in Babylon. He, you know, it's like, seek the welfare of the city in which you live because God, he's going to take care of you in those 70 years and he'll bring you back home. You know, the prophets really switched in many ways, from the emphasis being on judgment and devastation to saying God is with you, even in the midst of judgment. That's the message of Ezekiel. Like, yeah, you were fairly judged, you were rightly judged, this is, you know, you had it coming. But now God is with you, and God is going to be judging the Babylonians who are doing this to you. That since they're not in charge, God is in charge, and justice will be done, and the world will be made right. That's, that's the prophetic witness to the exiled people of Israel. And so here, but here, this is a song that has not heard the prophetic word yet. It's the song of total defeat and of humiliation. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Notice that it's, it's not explicitly addressed to God. It's, it's kind of, they're asking each other, like, how can we possibly sing the Lord's song in a foreign land. We just got done with Psalm 136. And the, the, it's, again, in the Psalter, you have to also pay attention to, like, why did they place certain psalms where they did? So once the Psalter got organized, it remained in its canonical form. And so the, the canonical form is an intentionality. There's an intentionality behind the canonical form of the Psalter, behind the ordering of the rough ordering of the psalms. And so we have this right after we just talked last week about 136. And what's the refrain of 136? His hesed, his steadfast love endures forever. Not so much. And isn't that a powerful witness within the canonical text that there are times that like we can sing the Lord, you know, his steadfast love endures forever. And he gave us all those victories and he defeated the Egyptians and all that. And we'll follow that right up with, we weren't feeling it in Babylon. We weren't feeling that steadfast love. And, and, and we were, you know, there was no mercy coming to our way from the Babylonians. You know, they, the Babylonians, you know, like, you know, again, it's, there was no Hague to appeal to in the ancient world. You know, there was, you know, there was, you know, you were, I mean, it was, war was horrible. I mean, it was really horrible. Well, it still is, in a mechanized sense, but in a sense, it was horrible up in your face. It was very personal. Um, and the depredations were personal. 
So how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land, songs like his steadfast love endures forever? How can we sing a song like that here? It's, it'd be a lie. It'd be a lie. That's the, that's the emotion, the spiritual emotion. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I don't remember you. In a sense, this is what's already happened. In a sense, this is a description of the, 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 the withering of the right hand, the, the, the kind of the deadening of the tongue, the, be, the becoming, in the you know, old-fashioned word, the becoming dumb, unable to speak, right? That, that's what's happened to them. It says it is, it's a description of a symptom that's already developed. Like, we, we can't sing our music. We can't sing God's praise. We don't have any words. We don't, because, you know, you have the phrase, I have no words. Right? They have no words. They have no words. They have no ability to, in a sense, respond with the creativity with which God has gifted them. They, they can't respond creatively to this challenge. <laughs> My right hand, the one that plays that harp. The harp is out of my hand. I hung it up. Um, so if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. And so the remember there is, uh, I, in a sense, an ironic statement in, or kind of a, it's an accusation. Basically, God, I remember Jerusalem. Do you remember us? I mean, I remember home. Do you remember, Lord? When we were the, you know, you're, are you remembering me? Do, am I in your mind? Do, you know, and and that's the the under that the subtext, the the ironical accusation of like, I remember you, Jerusalem. I remember my homeland, even if our God doesn't remember us. And I set it above my highest joy. I give it, you know, in a sense that is going home is the most important thing for me now. It's, it's, there's only home. There is no joy in the there in which I am living. Joy is only here in Zion, where I've been, from which I've been separated. So joy is only possible in the Lord's presence and knowing God's presence with you. And from, from verses 1 through 6, there are actually lots of psalm settings of just verses 1 through 6. And uh, because, in many ways, this is something that, again, the, the sufferer can enter into, like so many of the Psalms, the sufferer can enter into the very dark place from out of the depths I cry to you. We didn't do that song because that's actually a Lenten song. From out of the depths, deeper from this, from out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. From where is my help to come? So we sing that song. But this is another uh, a variation on the de profundis, the out of, from out of the depths I call to you, O Lord. Except in some ways it's even more radical because I'm not call I'm in the depths and I'm not calling out. <laughs> I, I'm, you know, is there because what is at the back of this is is there anyone there? If I were to call, would anyone answer? That's the that's the radical nature of suffering. That's what suffering and oppression and and having some a either a person or a force or a systemic uh, pressure take away your sense of selfhood and personhood. That's what happens. Like, is there anybody out there listening? Is there any, is justice a possibility? Right? So then that remember is then kind of then picked up in verse uh, 7. Now we're going to address the Lord. Remember, O oh Lord. Now we're going to talk to God. And we're going to ask kind of God to do his job of, of remembering. And the God who is on the side, and throughout the scriptural witness, the God who is on the side of the oppressed, on the side of the widow and the orphan, they're basically got our whole people. We got lots of orphans here, Lord. Lots of widows here. Because our, our men were all killed in Jerusalem. You know, that's about, you know, that's what you do. You kill the men, you take the women, the children. You know, that's how that's how war is waged in the not so ancient world. <laughs> and so basically the God who's the protector of the widow, the orphan, remember, if you you know, you're the God of injustice, you're the one who revealed yourself to us, has the God of justice, is the God of the oppressed, is the God of the poor, as the God of in the passage from Deuteronomy. 
the wandering Araman was my, and it's like, again, NRSV, my ancestor, my father, because it's, it's talking about Abraham. <laughs> like, you know, we came from a wandering guy, you know, that's who, this, that's, who that's talking about. It's like, it's very little in our SV. Um, you know, we, you know, good, good intentions, but you've obscured the meaning of the text. It's talking about Abraham. A wandering Arab man was my father Abraham. And it's basically saying, you know, the, the, the depth of Deuteronomy is basically a witness to Israel that no matter how prosperous you think you are, don't forget you came from a wandering immigrant like Abraham, who was powerless before the king, you know, who kind of had to, he had to be a little scrappy. <laughs> you know, to, to survive. You come from a scrappy people uh, living on the margins. That's what, you know, a nomadic, like Abraham, you have to think about nomadic, you know, kind of shapes live on the margins of agricultural communities in the ancient Levant, right? It, it's like, you know, the, 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 the city-states of the Philistines, like Gath and Sidon and Tyre. Um, prosperous trading, and then you have agricultural areas that feed those cities, and then on the margins up in the hill country where you can't really grow wheat, that's where you, you and so they're up in the hill hills and the foothills, and um, it's like don't forget where we came from. That's kind of what Deuteronomy is talking about. So remember, O oh Lord, against the Edomites. So Edomites here stand for opportunistic enemy slash neighbors. Yes, that's what the Edomites, the Edomites didn't actually conquer Judah. They didn't, they're not the ones who did it. They're just rooting for it. Like, aha, now we got, now, you know, now we can go in and take their best farms and because the, it's not like the, the Babylonians have other people to fight. They're going to go back home to go, you know, fight whoever they want to fight and expand their empire once they've conquered this area. And uh, they're going to establish a weak puppet regime in Jerusalem, that's what they did. They, they basically take one of the younger sons of the king, they, you know, and it's like, okay, now, actually, I think he was a nephew. And then it's like, you're, okay, you're in charge. He's quickly assassinated. You know, and that's the book of, Jer of Jeremiah. So there's some drama around that. And then the Babylonians come, it's like, oh, you're going to assassinate our puppet? Well, then we're going to kill all of you then. <laughs> so uh, it doesn't end well. So the Edomites are just like, okay, great. Now that Jerusalem's taken care of, now we can go in and just take the best pasture land and the water sources, and so now we can expand our footprint. Um, noting that again, in the in the in the narrative of Torah, the Edomites they are from Esau. They're they're remembered as cousins. In the in the conquests of David, you know, as he goes around fighting their neighbors and defeating them. <laughs> um, they, he's at a, at a battle outside the Edomite capital, and they're just shouting over the wall to each other. So, in other words, they speak the same language. They're speaking dialects of Aramaic. They can, so that's how close they are culturally. As kind of like, um, you know, hooray for the Babylonians instead of sticking with your distant kin, all those kin that you kind of fight with. It's kind of like you know, people in East Texas versus Western Louisiana. I mean, it's kind of like you know. It's like, um, you know, there's 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 some uh, rivalry there. Um, although there should be, you know, there is also cult close cultural kinship um, in those piney woods. Um, so remember, O oh Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem's fall, how they said, "Tear it down, tear it down, and down defend it. Have no mercy upon it. Have no mercy upon it." So those who, again, are the opportunistic or the betraying, the opportunistic enemy, or the betraying neighbor. Then, in verse 8, O daughter Babylon, you devastator. And Babylon here is the symbol, or stands as a symbol for the systemic superpower, you know, kind of like the systemic demonic oppressor. And after the exile, Babylon, of course, becomes code for whoever's boot is on their neck currently. So Babylon, so in the book of Daniel, get, comes to us in its canonical form uh, during the period of the Greek occupation. And so I've said this again in this class, but again, he's just like Daniel in the lion's den, the three young men in the furnace, 
those are stories about, those are stories of resistance, coded, and this is the thing, you know, this text is a, is a coded book of resistance in, in many parts of it, where it's a coded resistance text against the Greeks. Say, hey, we made it through the Babylonians. They were a tough lot. So we need to stay, stay, you know, stay fast, you know, stand fast. You know, we're going to get through these Greeks too, and the Greeks are going to go away. And then the Romans come along. And so Babylon becomes, again, that, that cipher through which one could read whoever is oppressing you at the moment becomes a symbol for all oppression. Actually, to put in, in the canon, in many senses, it, it replaces, though not fully, it replaces Egypt as the quintessential oppressor. Pharaoh is the it becomes Babylon. So it takes the place of Egypt as the quintessential enemy of God's people, which, by the way, is picked right up in the Book of Revelation to Saint John. Okay. That the the whore Babylon is again is that's just you know they're just is, that's a you know deeply rooted biblical symbol for in this case the Romans. But it's all code. You can't just say, you know, Caesar Augustus is going to go down in flames. That's the, that's the, you lose your head that way. But you can say, you know, and uh, and you know, they, they, you know, the Romans are like, why are they talking about Babylonians? It's like, is that, is that cash up right? I can't quite understand their language. But um, so you know, you you don't say the word, the name of the oppressor directly. Again, think the coded resistance of so many Negro spirituals coming out of the antebellum period that were coded songs about the Underground Railroad and about resistance to the de-selfing, the dehumanization of owners. So that, and, and so as long as you sang about Jesus, you know, and, and then, the, you know, the owners couldn't really tell the difference. They couldn't figure out who the true referent was in the song, but they knew. And so in the same way, Babylon and that, and, and that whole trope in the Old Testament, again, picked up by the people of God when they find themselves under Roman persecution by around, you know, starting around 80, 90 and forward, especially um, in a systematic way, systematic Roman persecution, um, they pick that trope right up because it's, it's basic. It's a basic trope. So... This is O Daughter Babylon, but of course it, it, it comes from a, a, an original reference in the exilic experience. Speaking specific again of the de destruction of Jerusalem. And then in the NRSV it translates it, happy shall they be, but it's, that's, that's not the word, it's blessed shall they be. It's again, in the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor, sometimes some English translations translate it, happy are the poor. That's a really, it doesn't ring true, does it? It's like, happy are those who grieve. It's known as blessed are, because the word, again, this is my you know, fight against the, those translators, but like the word blessed refers to something that's coming from God. Happy can be confused with some sort of like emotional affect that you're supposed to have in the middle of all that, as opposed to experiencing yourself as under the grace of God, even in those circumstances, the attitude. So here it is, blessed shall they be who pay you back for what you have done to us. Now, re now remember, or, just, or no, it does not say, blessed shall we be when we pay you back for what you did to us. It assumes that they are powerless. So this is not a prayer that God is going to help them rise up against their oppressors and slaughter them. In a sense, it's a, it's a reminder to the oppressed who aren't listening. That's, that's, that's kind of comes with the territory. <laughs> or it's a reminder to it's a reminder to the oppressor who is not listening that you know, as Jesus said, "Live by the sword, die by the sword, brother." It's like you know, there's going to be a meaner, badder fish come along. It's going to gobble you up and in the form of the Persians. <laughs> you know, so that's you know that's what's coming. That's what Isaiah is saying. It's like. Just over the hills <laughs> to the east and the north, there's somebody coming, and they've got better weapons, and they're you know they got horses, and they're gonna kill you all. Um, and so they did. Um, and so yeah, so Persian like cavalry, 
completely slaughtered uh, Babylonian chariots and um, you know, AKA heavy armor and uh, infantry. Um, so they ran up against a bigger, badder foe and they went the way of oppressors. And so what this psalm is basically, in some ways, it, it affirms the faith of the oppressed, which is the oppressor shall, it will come around and God's justice will be made manifest in a material way on the oppressor. You will be paid back. I mean, it, this isn't in a conditional. It's like, if you should happen to be able to, you know, it is blessed shall they be who, who pay you back. You know, for what you've done, it, it, is, it assumes that justice will ultimately, and that is the faith to which Israel clings with two hands. They cling to a God of justice. Like, we're not going to, and, and it's like, you think of like the wrestling of Jacob wrestling, right, with, with the angel. They cling to God. They're not going to let God go. That gummit, you know, they're, they're going to hold on until they get a blessing. Until, they, you know, they're, I'm not going to let you go. God, you are God of justice, and, you know, I don't know if you're there, but I'm still not going to let you go. Because justice is our only hope. And, and we're, we're not going to be, we're not going to be, um, if you'll pardon the expression, we're not going to be bougie about how we expect that justice to come around. We're not going to be nice. Because you are not nice people. And retribution and justice sometimes isn't nice when it gets paid out. I mean, again, I'm talking in terms of the Old Testament, you know, in terms of justice to God's people. Now, again, Sometimes we get uncomfortable with this because we've been on the wrong side of this a little bit. And people have prayed these sorts of prayers at us, whether they were praying it to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob or not. Lament is something that people who are powerless, that's all they've got. But we can pray for justice. And um, again, Jesus' word that in, in our own you know, just our moral lives, lives of community, that if, if one follows the way of coercion and violence, that's, there's, there's a result to that. And again, we remember how we've covered again and again the Psalter, the, the, there's a fundamental conviction in Israel that the moral logic of the universe is that evil consumes itself. That ultimately, evil's like a fire that kind of just burns around and then ultimately it'll get back to black and forest and it will die out. And and that, and that that's a good thing, <laughs> you know, and because God can make seeds pop up, you know, in that forest after evil's burned itself out, God can bring new growth, and out of the stump of Jesse, a rod shall arise. Right? It's, that's Israel's faith. Like, yeah, they, they cut down Jerusalem to the to the you know to the stump, and they the, the Edomites wanted to grind it down, <laughs> you know, in the mulch. And, but even out of that, God can bring out something new. And that's the faith of Israel. That's the faith of Israel. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. And again, that's not, a, um, that is much more, we just need to understand that it has a factual description of what happened in ancient warfare. And again, not so ancient warfare. That, uh, you know, you become, why? Why? Because infants just are a burden on a death march. I mean, if you're trying to march these people from point A to point B, nursing infants and toddlers are, they're, they're not going to speed, you know, they're just slowing down the train. So they got to go. You're going to have to kill them all and just leave the children who can walk, who you think can make it to Babylon. That's how it goes. I mean, that's... So, you know, let's not have any, you know, illusions about what is going on here. This was, this is what happened in Jerusalem. And then soldiers, again, because there is this, just there's this part of us. I mean, you might call it original sin. You might just call it whatever. There's this part of us that is, I don't know, rooted in the primate experience. I don't know. But there's a part of us that, which again, scientists, you know, it demonstrates this. It's in... It's deep down in there. You get pushed to a certain point. It's in there. You know, it's like, don't, don't deny it. Um, there may be some saints in the room, but most, you know, if you're, if you're like me, there's a part of you that exalts in bloodletting and violence. There's a part of the human. I mean, that's why it happens. 
because there's something deep and dark in us when we come up against people that we de-self, that we dehumanize, that we feel we can do whatever we want with. And so throwing children off the walls of, the, of Jerusalem down to the Valley Kidron would be fun sport for Babylonian soldiers. They, they have to have fun somehow. They're a long way from home, they've been working hard. So, you know, they're gonna do what soldiers do when they conquer cities. And gratuitous violence that humiliates and takes the, the hope away from the defeated peoples, that's your specialty. That's your specialty. Um, so that's what was that's what this is remembering. It's not saying this was a good, you know, this, you know, this is our plan for you Babylonians. This is just like somebody's gonna, you know, you live like this, you're an oppressor, somebody else is gonna come and take you and then do the same thing to you. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, you know, and again, it's from the per perspective of the victim who's currently under the boot. Again, they're not necessarily interested in nice ways of relieving them of oppression and pain. And that's just what we have to reckon with. And so again, it has, as we come to this as followers of Jesus, we, we do have a counter testimony in Jesus, in the manner in which Jesus goes to his death, right? So he's, you know, so Peter cuts off the ear of Malchus and Jesus says, enough, put your sword away, and he heals Malchus's ear. He shows mercy towards the one who's arresting him. Uh, you know, all through, the, uh, so many, uh, so much of the drama of the crucifixion, of the passion narrative, is highlighting how Jesus is at every point even as he speaks the truth to his oppressors, basically calling them out for behaving like Gentile. Basically, the, the whole, um, when Jesus says, behold, I see the Son of Man you know, coming in glory, sitting at the right hand of God, to Caiaphas, he's referencing a narrative in which, like, you know, I, I can't go over this, it's a different class to go over it point by point, but basically what Jesus is doing is he's referencing a whole narrative that Caiaphas would, would understand, and he's saying to Caiaphas through that quote, and saying, I'm the, I'm the son of man character in that, which means that Caiaphas is playing the role of Nebuchadnezzar, because it's from the book of Daniel, it's a quotation from the book of Daniel. So he's basically saying to Caiaphas and the high priesthood, you're playing the role of the Babylonian. You are the Babylonian oppressor. And that's what, you know. Do we need to hear anything more? I mean, because Caiaphas got the, got the gist. I mean, Ca I mean, Caiaphas wasn't an idiot. He knew exactly what Jesus was accusing him of. Don't think otherwise. And it's just like, that's why it's like, he tears his garments, this is blasphemy, because like that, you know, you're accusing me of being the godless pagan in the narrative. I'm the high priest, darn it, you know. You? You're the Messiah? That's, you know, that, that's like, that is, again, in the narrative, in the NRSV is, are you the Messiah, the Son of Blessed? It's like, it, it, it's, you have to hear it as, you, it's like, that you can actually, you can break it up in the punctuate, like, you are the Messiah? Like, I'm beating you up. How can you know you can't be the Messiah? You're pathetic. You're a Galilean peasant. There's no way. And so Jesus at every point is willing to tell the truth to those who are wounding him. At the same time, he's showing mercy at every point, right? He's showing mercy. He's willing to tell the truth to the weeping women of Jerusalem. It's like, hey, don't wait, weep for me. You're basically, your children are gonna be, the Romans are gonna come for your children, they're gonna do to your kids. And when he says, what, if this is what they do when the wood is green, what are they gonna do when it's dry and it's ready for a fire? So when you choose the way of violence and resist Rome with violence instead of with mercy and powerless love, then the Romans are gonna come over to this place and the, I'm just gonna be the first of the crosses. Your, your sons, oh women, weeping women, your sons will be put on crosses that will stretch out the road way past Golgotha. And that's what happened. You know, thousands of crucifixions after the, the capture of Jerusalem, right? I mean, so Jesus's prophetic word, you know, came true. He said, this, if you choose the way of violence, if you choose the way of death, this is the way, you know, what's happening to me. And so Jesus, as part of his ministry and his witness, takes that path, the all basically 
um, everything that they could hand him and takes it to himself and still reveals forgiveness and blessing in the middle of that. And that's the witness of the crucifixion. That's really the moral drama, if you will, of the crucifixion narrative. And, it, and so we come through Psalm 137, in a sense, for us, I think, as Jesus followers, this isn't Augustine, it's just, this is Rob Price, I'm sorry. That for us as Jesus followers, what we're called to do with, with 137, as, as we pray it, we're called to pray 137, is to allow 137 to open a window in our hearts to the suffering of the of, of people who are who are oppressed, the suffering of the victim. To kind of gain a window into their own sense of humiliation, of dehumanization, and to stand through praying this psalm with our hearts to stand in solidarity with the dehumanized, with the with the oppressed, with the humiliated, to stand fully with them and spiritually in saying this psalm, and then to lean into a word of, of grace. And then to go from there into the path of Jesus and to be instruments of mercy and of powerless love and vulnerability as we engage in that solidarity. That's the, that's the struggle. And that's, there's no easy answer, by the way, in doing that. That's the art of following Jesus. It's not something where you just say, oh, if that happens, then you do this. This is the more, you know, that's a legalistic ethic. If this infraction occurs, then you do this. If this happens to you, if, if, if your religious enemies do this, then you do that. I mean, they're, 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 the Quran is full of that. But that's not the way of following Jesus. The way of following Jesus is this hard way of trying to discover the way of suffering love. But in solidarity with those who are in the position of victim. So, anyway, it's a difficult psalm. But it's one which is given to us as a gift. We have to hold on to that, but it's been given to us as a gift through the whole power of the Holy Spirit and preserving it in the, in the canon, in the Psalter, for us to remember the Lord's mercy and his justice. All right. All right. I'll see you, see you next week. All right. Or for those of you staying, I'll see you in a few minutes. <laughs>